governmental organizations took hold and were like, nope, we got to stop recommending sunlight. The researchers were just using narrowband UV light and saying, 100% it's damaging. But that's not how it exists in sunlight. When we get it in appropriate ways, it's nothing but hearing for the human body. Hello, everyone. I am back today with returning guest Carrie Bennett. Carrie Bennett is an online educator in the emerging field of quantum biology, a clinician and sought after lecturer and guest speaker, and a faculty member of the Quantum Biology Collective in Kalamazoo College. Carrie, welcome. Thank you for joining me. I'm so excited to have a second conversation with you. Thanks for having me again, Melissa. Let's dive into this. I'm so excited. This question was in my comments. What about people that are truly night owls and really have a hard time like settling down and going to sleep when the sun goes down and then getting up in the morning when the sun comes up? And I'm married to one. So I know like he really does function better staying up later at night. So what advice do you have for those people? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one I get quite a bit. And I want to distinguish a couple of things I see clinically. Clinically, I see people who self like they classify themselves as night owls, but really their desire to go to bed later and feel like they're more productive later at night has been built into them based on what we call phase shifting their circadian rhythm. Things like artificial light at, light at night, the exposure to that lowest frequencies can actually drive a second energetic, like energizing response of cortisol, right? We're supposed to get this cortisol surge in the morning. You can see when you test some people that they get this second cortisol surge at night when it's not supposed to happen, which translates oftentimes to a second wind, this feeling of like, that's when I feel like I'm my, my most productive, my most creative. And then that then will delay bedtime oftentimes until, oh, let's say one, two, two o'clock in the morning, somewhere there. And so I see those people, which who I, we help to work on these circadian principles of just being consistent about blocking the artificial light and honoring what I call your first sign of fatigue. Because anyone who has a baby knows that the baby doesn't go to sleep better if you just keep the baby awake longer and longer and longer. Baby goes to sleep best when you like catch that first little yawn or that first little bit of crankiness and then you put baby to sleep, right? And so we actually need to recognize that too. I used to be that second wind person, right? I was like, oh, but I get this productivity. But I recognized then that when I started putting, connecting these dots, wait a second, I would feel really tired and then I would turn on the TV and then I would stare at my phone. And that's when I would get my second wind. It's like, I could have just kind of relaxed on the couch, maybe read a book and fallen asleep had I done it that way. My second wind was tied to my light exposure, that bright blue light exposure that kind of elevated my cortisol. So I encourage people to just kind of, are you truly a night owl or do you get that second wind because of your light exposure at night? That being said, there are absolutely, there's a subset of the population that they are night owls. It's about three to 5% of the population in clinical practice. So while I do have probably about 75% of my clients come in self-diagnosed as a night owl, it turns out that there's just a very small portion that truly do have more of the genetic makeup of a night owl. And so, and if that's you, you're going to go very much against what I say a lot of these things because you do, you naturally want to go to sleep at a later time. Uh, you naturally want to sleep in and wake up at a later time. And that's perfectly acceptable. But I do need even my night owls to be aware that when the body was developing this over the course of however many generations this has come down through the more of a genetic makeup for them, it was developed in a light setting where still your artificial light at night exposure, your ancestral light exposure would have been campfire and not what we're currently being exposed to. So even though you may still feel like you want to go to bed and you truly, your body is designed to go to bed around one o'clock in the morning, I still encourage you to do the same thing. Put on your orange tone blue blockers after dark to protect your eyes from getting that artificial cortisol surge so that when you do fall asleep, you have lots of melatonin. You can run all of your repair programs that your body is designed to run when you are asleep to kind of reverse age the damage that naturally occurred during the day. And then when, as soon as you wake up in the morning, it might not be at sunrise, it might be at 10 o'clock, you still want to go outside and sync up with the natural light signals. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I was really wondering if there might be some people who are wired a little bit differently. 
But I suspected, and of course, I didn't say this because I'm not an expert, but I, I suspected that maybe it did have something to do with blue light exposure for a lot of people because it just makes such a huge difference. I had a couple of nights where I was on my computer working later into the night, and I typically don't do that at all anymore. But it was crazy how much it messed with my sleep. I had a couple of nights where I just was waking up all night long, and that usually doesn't happen to me anymore. Yeah, yeah, I see that. That's it. It's so cool that you're like have the perception that like you can really understand what your body is being exposed to and then what might be happening that's out of normal, out of the pattern. Mm -hmm. And you could draw those connections. I encourage other people to do the same thing. Just kind of observe. I mean, yeah, sometimes we are like got to live life, right? But then to know what happens and how your sleep might be transformed or like changed or maybe you don't like the way you slept that night. That exact experience is what motivates me to be like, okay, I would rather wake up earlier in the morning and get my computer work done if I have to, because I know my body responds to that light differently, even if it's like five o'clock in the morning, as opposed to like nine o'clock at night, it's completely different sensation in my body. Right. That actually brings up a question that I had for you, because I have a red light panel and I was wondering, what's the best time of day to use that? I have noticed that if I use it before I go to bed, because it's so bright, it ends up keeping me awake longer. So I've been doing it first thing in the morning, but is it better to do it before or after that initial sunlight exposure? In an ideal world, we are doing it between sunrise and sunset. But if you're going to have to do it sometime where you're not like doing mom stuff or work, you know, like living your life, right? Then the morning is going to be way better. Okay. And what so like what happens at night is at night, our pupils are very sensitive to constricting. Another signal to our brain the time of day is how much our pupils can dilate when we're outside versus how much they constrict. And so picture what happens if you have been kind of doing these circadian practices and you've got your pupils dilating because as the light is dimming, you're protecting your eyes from the artificial light. And then all of a sudden you do, you turn on a bright red light therapy. Piece. Even if you're wearing your glasses, all of a sudden the brain's like, oh, daytime, like, like well, let's wake back up. Right. Okay. And one final question about that. Is it recommended to use a red light panel with children or do they need to be older before you start exposing them to that? No, you can use that at any age. They're very safe. I encourage everyone the first time they use a panel just to start like with a small, short duration. So a short exposure that would look something like two to five minutes at about 10 inches from the panel just to see how the body feels and adjust from there. But what I am finding actually, and a lot of my other colleagues in this space are also finding is that you can, people can do more and more and more and more. And we only get this added, added to benefit to it. So start small, see how, what your experience is, but like adjust accordingly. And what you'd be appreciative of is like, I just got this new red light therapy panel. I absolutely love this one from this company. And this is a woman who has been in this quantum health space for quite some time. And so I got one of her panels and I turned it on and it's more intense light. It's a really intense version of red light. Guess who will always come around me whenever that panel is on? Either my children or my cats. There's oh, wow. Some, I always have uh, just someone else, like they're drawn to it, right? And so like, that's my signal right there. Like cats and animals, they inherently know what feels good to them. And so the fact that they were just like, I, I can't have a, a session without them around me. It's just like, that's just kind of another little clue. Like, wait a second, this really truly feels great to me. The panel feels beautifully and soothing and healing to me. And that just reinforces that. <laughs> It's so funny that you mentioned that because sometimes my cats are in the room with me and they get so playful when the red light is on. Even more than usual, they'll be rolling on their backs and nipping at my hands and just wanting to play. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I get, my, I get the cats if I'm lying on my side with the panel, they'll nudge up against me like, please pet me, play with me. Exactly, exactly. It's perfect. Okay. I know I said that was the last question, but then I thought of another one. Okay, go for it. Oh, something really interesting that I've noticed is I, for my entire life, I have always burned in the sun, no matter what I do. I always get one or two really bad sunburns. But this year, that has not happened. I mean, I had a couple times where a little bit, and I noticed that it was on the top of my head and my forehead mostly that it was happening. And I started thinking, 
that this is so weird. Like, what could the difference be? Is it possible that the red light panel is like building up my resistance to getting a sunburn somehow? Yeah, absolutely. There's two things happening, right? The language that we use kind of in this quantum biology space is the red and the near infrared wavelengths in that panel precondition the skin to receive the more intense wavelengths of UV light without them causing damage. So that's absolutely something that happens. And then number two, you can use it before you go outside and have that beneficial effect. You could use it after you go outside and have that beneficial effect. And you, what you recognize now too, Melissa, is this need to like, okay, I'm going to go out at sunrise or I'm going to like people who maximize at least like morning sunlight outside, people who go outside before those UV rays appear, they actually start to coach into their brain to make melanin and make uropanic acid and these what we call endogenous UV filters in the skin. So your body is better equipped at handling that UV light without causing a burn, a burning response at all. It's, it's something I hear all the time. It's like, oh, my daughter, she's so fair skinned, blue eyes. She always burns. We spent a week at the beach. We didn't have to put sunscreen on. She never burned. Just because people understand how to use sunlight in the sequential way that it's designed to be applied to our skin. Wow, that's fascinating. And I'm so glad this information is coming out because, again, that's something that I always wondered about. Like, why is it that we burn so easily? Because obviously we've evolved in relation with nature. We didn't used to have houses and cars like this. We were outside all the time. So it's like somebody like me who's going to go out for 10 minutes and get burned. Like, how does that work? Like, that, that can't be how it was happening back in the day when we were outside all the time. So this makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. We're just uh, like, uh, I would say we are the ones who have stepped outside or like we changed our environment, modified our sunlight exposure to make it the potential like what you're in Michigan, right? This is what a typical Michigan does in the middle of summer. We work all day, we're inside. And then maybe on the weekend, we head to Lake Michigan, like here we head to the beach, we head to the lake. We're on a boat all day or we're at the shore. And that's when we go there maybe at noon and we get this intense amount of light in a short period of time without having adapted to it. That is where we're ill-equipped to handle. We're not equipped to handle sunlight in that type of an exposure, but we're very equipped to handle getting the sunlight both from an early morning perspective onward and from a seasonal perspective. So like starting in spring, you know what it feels like to maybe say the, the, the first nice day in April, it's like, Uh, Yeah, I'm going to get my t-shirt, my tank top on. I'm going to go out. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to garden. And you start to then get those that sunlight exposure that way, starting when the the light is less intense in the spring. So that by the time you get to the middle of July, August, again, your body has adapted to it. And the other thing with that is a lot of us, and I was horribly, I was guilty of this. I didn't know it mattered. But anytime a lot of, I used to go to the beach, I used to wear sunglasses because light blue eyes, right? I used to have this sun sensitivity to my eyes. Picture what happens when you block the UV signal from entering the eye and communicating to the brain, but there's a strong UV signal on the skin. It's a complete mismatch. We're designed to have the the UV light entering the eyes, communicating to the brain, oh, there's really intense ultraviolet light. Let's start to increase the pathways in the skin that protect the skin. And if we're blocking our eyes from communicating that signal to the brain, we don't create the same signaling in the skin. So again, we're more likely to burn. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. And that's something that so many people probably have no idea of. Right. Right. I didn't. That's for sure. (laughs) Okay. So moving on, I have a few questions from somebody who emailed me. So I'll leave his name anonymous, but this person is a frequent watcher and commenter on my channel. So thank you very much for sending these questions. And uh, he's been working in the sciences within the semiconductor industry since 1989, he says. So he had some questions about magnetism and some of the things that we talked about in the previous episode seem to contradict with some of the things that he knows because of the industry that he worked in. So for a background for the viewers, we were talking about grounding by getting the bare skin on the earth, which is something that's been huge for me for my entire life. So I know it's a thing just based on my own experience. But he says magnet field lines do not have to be encountered only while touching bare feet to the ground. They penetrate the earth's solid outer shell 
from the moving liquid iron currents which generate them deep below and reach all the way up into space as evidenced by their capture of the sun's solar wind to form the northern light. So what is the benefit of actually touching the bare skin to the ground to catch that magnetic field? It's twofold. It's not necessarily just the magnetic field. So let's break that down because I, I must not have been clear in that previous episode. So first and foremost, that's an absolutely correct statement, right? Those solar winds, all the stuff that we get shielded from our magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field is powerful. It does. It extends way beyond the surface of the Earth, way out into the atmosphere and beyond. So absolutely true. What I want to just acknowledge is that the reason why we're not tapping into it the same way is that we're surrounded by a lot of what we call non-native magnetic fields and non-native electromagnetic fields these days. What are those? That's legitimately appliances create non-native magnetic fields. Every wireless device will create a non-native electromagnetic field. And so one of the things that I'm noticing in, in clinical practice is that it's like, what is your signal to noise ratio, right? Like, yes, that signal is strong. And that's sig- And we were designed to feel that signal regardless of where we were on planet Earth. But these days, there's a lot of noise and a lot of static in the way. And because of that, I really find people benefit from truly getting into nature as part of the way they experience that true magnetic signaling without all of the static that's in, in, in the way that we can get in a typical workstation or just in a typical indoor indoor living space these days. Mm-hmm. But number two, it's actually electron flow that we're getting from the Earth. And that is because what's been shown is that the Earth actually is pretty much an infinite source of electrons. And we have the ability to pull those electrons into our body. Uh, research going back Quite some time now. Actually, I want to say maybe even Albert St. Georgie, who was a Nobel laureate, what was one of the ones who made the first comment decades and decades ago that the body has the ability to act as a semiconductor, meaning that certain tissues in our body are ar- arranged in specific patterns to be able to flow electrons. And one of those particular tissues is our connective tissue, plus the exclusion zone water, the way water structures itself around that connective tissue also can act as a semiconductor. And if this individual is interested, it acts more like an N-type semiconductor. And what happens there is we, we connect our body to the surface of the earth, we can flow the electrons into our body. And that can be seen in many different ways. We know that the flow happens instantaneously, but what we can measure in very interesting research is you can see things like a lowering of inflammation after having touched the earth for quite some time. Because an area that's experiencing inflammation is an area there, where there's a lot of what we call reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress. That's, that's where things are stealing electrons to create inflammation. And so essentially that makes sense. The body says, I connect to the surface of the earth. I flow electrons to the source of inflammation and I can help calm the inflammation because electrons le- are able to basically quench and calm what's happening with that oxidative stress. The other thing you can see is in before and after images of what we see with red blood cells before earthing and after earthing, that there's this pattern of red blood cells that's not a thing, not a healthy thing we want to see in blood. So in a live blood analysis, you can see red blood cells stacking on top of each other at looking like pancakes. So we maybe have all seen a red blood cell kind of looks like a disc, right? And its job is to be an independent carrier of oxygen throughout my blood vessels. And you can imagine, if this is supposed to carry a b- blood or a oxygen and other nutrients throughout my bloodstream, and I start to stack them up on top of each other, that's not an independent raft that can transport easily through the bloodstream. And that is associated with clotting, bad blood flow, and just not a healthy thing to see in the bloodstream. And after five to 10 minutes of earthing, we actually see these red blood cells that were once stacked together puff away from each other. And they start to repel each other. Like they will not physically touch even if you want, want them to. And that's because of the fact that red, healthy red blood cells have what we call a halo of electrons around them. The term is zeta potential. And so when these red blood cells are lacking in it, they can stack up on top of each other. But when you have all of these negatively charged electrons and creating this halo around the red blood cell, two negatively charged blood cells aren't going to want to touch each other. That's why you can't touch two poles of the same magnet, like two of the same poles of the magnet together, right? You can't touch two North Poles together. 
you there, there are things that repel. And so these like charges will also repel each other. And that then reestablishes these independent transporting porter rafts on these red blood cells carrying oxygen through the bloodstream. And so, yeah, you it's it's a different effect that we're having happen. We're actually reestablishing electron charge, electron flow and and reestablishing where there's an electron need. The body can pull those electrons in real time and do that through earthing. There is a book by James Oshman called Energy Medicine in Human Performance. It's a fascinating one. It sounds kind of out there, but it legitimately goes into the biophysics, including how the body really does act very much like our modern electronics devices and shows parallels. So if this listener is interested in that, I would really highly recommend that book. Thank you. I think I'm going to get that for myself. It sounds interesting to me. Sure. Yeah. So maybe one more question here and then we'll get into some other topics. But another point that he brought up that I thought might be good to cover is why we don't feel a shock if we step outside and we're taking up electrons through the bottom of our feet. And he said, if there's a problem with electron depletion in the body, it would be very measurable with a voltmeter. Also, we would find ourselves shocked on the bottoms of our feet, taking the first step out of our homes and onto the ground if there's any significant voltage difference. And there is. It just so much. We're talking about such small amounts of millivolts, right? And so the way you measure that in the health of a cell is in different millivoltages. So again, and then the earthing book, this listener would want to read the earthing book because there's really legitimately a, we have amassed a ton of research and information on this and then how to apply it clinically. But you're dealing with such a small amount, right? And so what happens is, is that as a cell, a healthy cell is defined as having an interior millivoltage of negative 20 to 25. You also have cell membranes that hold electrostatic charge. And that's things like negative 70 millivolts, right? We got places in the body where we do, we have these millivoltages, but they're, we're talking small. These are tiny, right? And so, yes, I have had people say that same question before, but no, it's not going to show up in the same way that you can measure it in electronics devices at all. And if you do, they can definitely measure this in a laboratory setting, in like a cell tissue culture setting by doing things, measuring just as he's describing. It's just not going to be measurable. At least there's not a device that I know that's measurable for actually what's happening in human physiology and that shift in human physiology when you go from not touching the surface of the earth to touching the surface of the earth. Right. I know for myself, I can feel something. It's not like a volt of electricity or something, but it's like the fatigue just falling off my body. It's like, it's hard to describe it. It's like, this might sound a little weird, but I feel like I can, my, the bottom of my feet is picking up information Mm -hmm. and it just feels, there's certain things I really like to walk on, like wet grass or compost, things like that. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. So like, this is kind of an interesting connection where in quantum physics, quantum biology, you can't really separate energy and information. So if we're talking about electrons flowing in, that's energy, but that carries information as well. And so really that's what you're looking at. Yeah, you're getting those electrons, but those electrons are also full of information because in that, like we said, in that f- quantum physics or just quantum mechanics perspective, you can't separate the two. So your, your intuition is spot on. So this is then where you can look at the before and after, effect, before earthing and after earthing with the autonomic nervous system. And within seconds, it achieves balance. And so that's the part of our nervous system that's divided into the stressed state, the fight or flight. And then the relaxed state, the rest and digest. And we always want it to be in balance, kind of working back and forth. And that could be measured with heart rate variability. But oftentimes we're living in one side or the other and typically more in the stressed out state. And so what people experience, like you said, legitimately within seconds of everything is a balance of autonomic function. They're the side that those parts of the nervous system are communicating again. And so that brings everything back into what's called balance or tone. And again, yeah, that's very much a consistent measurement and just a consistent experience that people get with earthing regularly. Well, Carrie, I want to take a moment to thank you for putting this information out there. I shared in our last interview how horrible I had been feeling. And it was like I would go in waves where I would feel okay for a little while. And then I but I would always get hit with this really bad cycle of fatigue and digestive issues and 
all of these health problems that would make it really hard for me to function. And I've had this for my entire adult life. But since discovering your Instagram last summer, so it has been almost a year now, I have not had one bad cycle. Um, I've been able to handle, like, adjust to the heat, which is really hard for me in the summer. I'm actually in the gym working out, lifting weights three times a week, which I could never, never had the energy to sustain. I would always get a huge adrenal crash if I started to try working out. So there really is something to this. I feel good all the time. I have energy. I mean, I get tired sometimes, but I never can't handle my life. Totally. Yeah. It, we're meant to go through periods where we do get a little tired, right? That's a normal human human experience. We have to just acknowledge it. And sometimes, yeah, do I need a nap or just to sit for a little while and crash? Absolutely. But that's so cool to hear that like your body, you can push your body, but you also have the energy to recover from that weight, the workouts and the push. I mean, that's just such, such a beautiful story, Melissa. I'm just so grateful to hear it. Thank you for sharing. I just hope that inspires some other people as well to just try this stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. One other question that I had thought about asking you, we didn't talk about this before we started the interview. Do you have any recommendations on diet? Because I've heard you say that most people's only source of electrons is through their diet right now, and that's just not enough. But if you have all of these other things in place where you're getting sunlight and you're getting temperature exposure and you're grounding, is there still like an ideal diet that you should be following to support your health? Oh, that's a great question. Great question. And you're exactly right. Like we are designed to get energy, derive energy from other sources beyond food. Let me, I'm going to put this out there. And you probably heard me say this too. I touch what people eat the, as the absolute last thing. I want to talk about like when you eat during a course of a day. I want to talk about how you're eating that food. And then finally, I talk about the what. So I think what's important to recognize is first with food, we're designed to eat it within a circadian window of time. We're not meant to make stomach acid and digestive enzymes 24 hours a day. And so when you look at when we have the ability to best produce those things that help us digest our food and absorb the nutrients, it happens between about sunrise and sunset, maybe a little after sunset, depending. That means that, again, we're not necessarily built to have that midnight snack. Things can get really thrown out of whack when we do that. We're meant to basically have digest in our food uh, but by the time we go to sleep so that we don't have to worry about extracting those nutrients anymore. And instead, we can go into repair processes. And so I'd much rather help clients kind of focus on what I call their window of time. What does your window of fueling look like? So sunrise to sunset's a good place to start. Some people shrink it earlier. But I always encourage starting at sunrise because that optimizes a hormone that's called leptin. And leptin is a hormone that's responsible for communicating to my brain how much stored energy I have. And so leptin's job every night when I sleep is to dock in the hypothalamus and be like, Carrie's got this much stored body fat. She's got this much stored glycogen as like a stored sugar in her liver and her muscles. That means we're going to dictate Carrie's hunger level to be this tomorrow. And then we're going to dictate Carrie's ability to have a baby. Like, is she in a state of like optimum fertility? Like, that's all the body wants to know. Basically, like, is, is she a threat? Is she starving? Can she make a baby? And so when we can communicate that, right? Like consistently, because we're getting good sleep and leptin is communicating, then really the body self adjusts what it eats. It, I, though it's going to sound crazy unless you've tried it, but I hear people tell me that cravings go away, the desire to snack into the evening or at night goes away drastically. Sugar cravings drop drastically. And that's because we're designed also then after we set the time of day, body has three needs, I say in the morning. It wants to know the time of day. It wants to know where it is on the planet, which we do by just going outside, right? Like it helps us geolocate, get out of the static indoors, and it helps us set our circadian rhythm. And then finally, it wants to know that we're fed and it doesn't have to stress out about finding food. And so if we can sync all of those things up, that really creates strong leptin signaling that will regulate appetite for the remainder of the day. And I prefer clients to start, depending on if, what, the, what, their, what I call their adiposity or the amount of adipose or body fat they have on their body, I typically have them start with a more protein-rich 
and lower carb breakfast because that will also optimize leptin signaling. And then the other thing, right, before I even touch what, like what you're eating is spacing your meals out. Because again, leptin has to have time. We have to digest our food. Leptin has to be released from body fat after we've digested our food. And then during the day, it also communicates to the brain. Carrie just ate this much. She had that, this much protein, this much fat, this many nutrients. We've stored a little bit of sugar in the liver. Now we're going to signal when Carrie is hungry again. And if we eat too soon, too frequently, we disrupt that, that uh, signaling, that communication pathway. So I then say four to six hours is like a, a, the stretch of time that you're looking to, to before you have your next meal. And then again, four to six hours later as well. And so I want to optimize all of that before I touch what you eat. And then what you eat is typically I, I coach you to eat more seasonally and locally. Right. That makes so much sense. So Carrie, one of my favorite things that you say is that sunlight is a nutrient. And I think you've actually said that sunlight is one of our most missing nutrients in our diet for a lot of people. But you've talked about how each wavelength of light sends different signals to our body. And I'm really curious to know what each wavelength of light, what roles are those playing for our body? It's, it's a great question, a beautiful way of looking at it, right? Sunlight as a nutrient and how just as sometimes you might have heard someone say, eat the rainbow of colors because all the different colors of produce contain different nutrients. We have to recognize that sunlight contains a rainbow of colors as well and that we interact with those colors and use those colors, which in what, it's what we call wavelengths, right? We use those different wavelengths of light to help optimize different physiological processes. And so I want to key in on a couple. First and foremost, everyone has seen a light in a rainbow or through a prism probably where you actually see the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And so we know all those colors are present. And just before we get to the red, you have something called the infrared range of light. And below the violet, you have the ultraviolet light. And it's that spectrum from infrared through the visible light that we can see all the way to the ultraviolet that are the most biologically impactful. And so we're research is really just starting to touch on our ability to sense light and use it in what we call a non-visual way. Back in the day, all we thought was, oh yeah, we, see, we use light to see and distinguish our objects in our vision, right? In our visual field. And so now the research is on what type of sensors or receptors do we have in our eyes, on our skin, even deeper than that in our subcutaneous fat, that's the pinchable fat between the skin and the muscle. What types of sensors do we have for light all throughout our body? And they're finding where we've got sensors for a lot of key wavelengths. And so the wavelengths, of, and I'm certain there's more than that. These are just what we found so far, right? But we've got sensors for the blue wavelengths of light. We've got sensors, different sensors for the ultraviolet wavelengths of light. And then we really do utilize the red and the infrared um, for some very key purposes inside of the body. So where do you want to start? Like we can talk about all those colors. Yeah, maybe let's start with infrared and then just work our way up. Yeah, that's a great place to start. Okay, I love it. Makes perfect sense. Because in the morning, before the sun breaks the horizon, that's where the light is really rich in the infrared and red wavelengths. So, I'm, and same thing at sunset, right? I'm certain we've all had that experience of just before sunrise and just after sunset where we see the pinks and the oranges and that red tone. So that's red and infrared. And you can take a little measuring device called a spectrometer and you can measure if you want, if you're curious what times of day, like what colors are present. But that red and the infrared are the same wavelengths that are found in your red light therapy panel that you were talking about. And what we know that what they do is they do a couple of things. Number one, they are very supportive of mitochondrial health. And so they help mitochondria build something called a membrane potential so that the mitochondria can help us make more water and ATP. And those are two, what I would consider two energy currencies of the body. And that water that's made in the mitochondria actually structures itself into a battery of energy, potential energy. And the way it rearranges its molecular configuration and infrared helps to wa- the water to do that inside of our body. 
Dr. Pollock's research at his lab showed that infrared wavelengths of wavelength of light actually helps to create this structured water, what he calls exclusion zone or easy water network in our body that gets really depleted with indoor living because indoor, we, the windows block the infrared, the light bulbs have subtracted the infrared. And so we're really in a very defi- infrared deficient environment compared to if we were being to be outside. And so he showed that, yes, when we're indoors, we can shrink that exclusion zone water network. And when we're outside exposed to the infrared, which is there from dawn all day long through dusk, we can expand it fourfold. And so there's a ton of actually biological implications to that. But just know that the infrared wavelengths of light are so key to support the water network of our body. And then the red wavelengths are really beneficial for our mitochondrial health. And then when the sun bridges the horizon, that's when you can see on your little, on the little spectrometer that the red and infrared, which were dominant, are now balanced out by blue. The blue has reached that same peak as the red and the infrared. And the, that blue reaching that peak, that's what kicks off my circadian rhythm, right? That's what really communicates time of day to my whole entire body. Because I've got blue light sensors in the backs of my eyes and there's a connection. There's a pathway from those sensors all the way to the clock in my brain. And so that connection gets basically triggered anytime there's blue wavelengths of light. And it, they start out to be kind of less and less and less blue wavelengths and less intense at sunrise. They build up more and more and more and more until the sun reaches the high point of the sky at solar noon. And then they go away until again, they're gone at sunset. So the brain uses the amount and intensity and and how it changes throughout the day to tell time. And it communicates that time to every cell in my body because every cell has what we call a clock inside of it, waiting to key in on the time of day to know what proteins to make, what hormones to make, what receptors to bring to the surface of the cell. Everything is coordinated based on this timing. And then lastly, as the sun gets higher in the sky, you get the ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet light is not there at sunrise. It's not there at sunset. It only starts to appear when the sun is what we call 10 degrees above the horizon. And that's the point at which ultraviolet A appears, the first version, but the first wavelength range of ultraviolet light. And that ultraviolet A is really key in signaling and optimizing what I call neurochemistry in the brain. So the, we've got a lot of these little aromatic amino acids in our eyes. These are just building blocks of molecules and proteins, and they're actually very receptive to ultraviolet light. And so as soon as the eyes recognize that there's ultraviolet light, those um, aromatic amino acids capture those wavelengths and photons provide energy for these uh, molecules to become something else. And so, for example, tryptophan becomes serotonin upon exposure to ultraviolet A light through my eyes. Um, tyrosine becomes, and phenylalanine become dopamine or thi- they can drive thyroid chemistry and thyroid hormone production. It can balance out adrenaline and noradrenaline. And the bottom line is all of those things make me feel really alert and awake and motivated and focused simply from morning light exposure. And so like, uh, th- th- I mean, that's what I, that's probably a key window of time that morning, what I call UVA rise for people to go outside and do some gardening or take a walk or just sit in sky gaze because people feel that. That's where you're like, wow, I do feel more focused and more energized there. And then when the sun gets a little higher, Melissa, 30 degrees above the horizon, that's when ultraviolet B appears. And that's the wavelength range that people I think are familiar with when it comes to how when it strikes the skin, it makes vitamin D. But it doesn't just make vitamin D like we get in a supplement. It makes that version of vitamin D and dozens of metabolites that can interchange with other metabolites. So very much a more what I call a broad spectrum vitamin D that we get from sunlight exposure as opposed to just taking it in supplement form. Fascinating. So the medical experts have been telling us for a while, too, that UVA and UVB light are very dangerous for us and not to even go outside without sunscreen, even if it's like not very bright. Like even in the winter, some experts will say, put sunscreen on before you go outside. What would you say in response to that advice? Yeah, sure. That's a fascinating area of study. So I did a really big research dive into why those recommendations came about. And what I found was you had, there was like a schism in the research community uh, around this turn of the the 1900s, like the beginning of the 1900s, 
because up till then you had a bunch of clinicians and one of the most well-known one, his name is Auguste Rollier, that were using light in what he called heliotherapy clinics on the Swiss Alps, right? A very ultraviolet intense place to be as on top of a mountain. And he was saying, look at these thousands of patients I have, and I'm with just ultraviolet light exposure on their bodies at key times from sunlight. I'm reversing diabetes and atherosclerosis, and I'm so many different infectious diseases and cancer. He was showing just so many healing benefits from it. And then you had another group of researchers who were studying ultraviolet light in a lab setting where they took a a tissue of cells, like a cell culture, and they would shine just the ultraviolet wavelengths of light at it. And they were saying, but look, when we just shine UV light at these cells, they can mutate and there's DNA damage. And there's obviously that this can drive cancer. And why would we be recommending sunlight when we can see these damaging effects? This is ionizing radiation, damaging radiation to these cells. And so I, I think which side won out ultimately but what you have to recognize is that yeah, any, no one, I wouldn't deny that if I were to apply UVB light by itself onto my skin for an extended period of time, that it would da- it's damaging. A hundred percent it's damaging. But that's not how it exists in sunlight. You never just get isolated near what's called narrow bands UV light. You have all the other colors. And you have the, the, the effect that we talked about earlier where the colors layer themselves on. And you get that preconditioning of the skin beforehand with the red and the infrared before the UV comes. And when UV comes, it's a less intense version of UV until, yeah, at some point in the middle of the day, you get a massive amount of UVB light. But again, it's balanced by all the other colors. And so that's what Rolier and his heliotherapy clinics were showing. They were recognized, they were finding the benefit because that's how they were applying sunlight for therapeutic purposes. Whereas the research base, the researchers were just using narrowband UV light and saying, but there's damage. At that point, really, governmental organizations took hold and were like, nope, we got to stop recommending sunlight. And I don't know if it was for nefarious purposes or just out of true caution for human health, but I don't think it served us well. I think I now and knowing everything I know about the benefits of ultraviolet light and when we get it in appropriate ways, it's nothing but hearing for the human body. So some people after hearing this may be thinking, well, if light is so beneficial to us, maybe we should all move down south to Florida or Hawaii. And some people have done that. But this leads to another question that I've kind of been thinking about and want to ask you, is there benefit to living in colder climates as well? And I'm pretty sure in one of your talks, I heard you saying something about that some people's DNA uncouples. And yeah. they're like supposed to... Mitochondria uncoupling. Oh, okay. Can yeah. you explain that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you're right. Have I had clients move to, let's say, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and f- just feel amazing and heal from autoimmune conditions? Absolutely. I have seen that happen. But have I had clients who live in Michigan and experience the darkness and the cold also heal? Absolutely. And here's what. Because while sunlight provides its own whole host of benefits, there's also a healing benefit of darkness and a healing benefit of cold. And so in Michigan, I like to say those of us who live further from the equator, what we're experiencing is we maximize the light benefits in the summer and we have to maximize the benefits of dark and cold in the winter. And if we do that, we're going to turn on a lot of healing programs. So dark and cold are known to stimulate various pathways that people are trying to mimic with things like fasting, right? Like fasting turns on these longevity pathways and anti-aging pathways and autophagy. All that's true, but also so does cold and darkness. And so does the natural, what I would say, food scarcity that we're going to get in winter as it is. Because in the middle of winter, sun's going to rise at 8 a.m. It's going to set around 5 p.m. That naturally narrows my fueling window. And so I'm going to have a longer fasting window in the winter. I'm going to have more darkness in the winter. And then if I allow my body to experience it, I get free cold therapy simply from stepping outside in the winter. And all of those things work together to really support a lot of the restorative pathways that people are trying to get with things like fasting and jumping into a cold plunge tank. Not to say that there's those things are bad, but we can get them in, in nature as well if it's part of our environment. 
And some people are very also keen, are able to use cold in order to heal their mitochondria. And what I mean is you can do a 23 and me if you want to, but people have done that. And they will show you what's called your mitochondrial haplo group, which is a fancy word for saying, where did your mitochondria originate from? And we now know that mitochondria are inherited along the maternal lineage. So from mom and grandma and great grandma and great great grandma and so on. And we can now trace people's mitochondria back to thousands of years, about tens of thousands of years ago to know where they originated. And if you know where the mitochondria originated, you'll know. Can these have these, did these mitochondria need to experience cold in that environment? And if they did, they had to learn how to do something called uncouple. So certain populations of mitochondria in our body will do something called uncouple, which is a fancy word for just saying make heat. And so my mitochondria originated in more of a Northern European lineage. My mitochondria in the middle of winter can uncouple and heat me up and thermoregulate my body temperature. And as they do that, that's another actually healing thing for mitochondria to be able to do to heal themselves as well. So not only are we keeping the body warm, but the mitochondria are keeping themselves healthy as well. Whereas I've got colleagues, my co- one of my colleagues in Florida, he, his mitochondria do not uncouple. And so is he better suited maybe for a Florida environment? Absolutely. And does he experience the cold? He will in his cold plunge. He's self-described as like, he'll never live in Michigan, right? He would never be able to li- to survive a Michigan winter because of that. And so I think that there's that aspect too. We can look at Michigan as an opportunity if we allow our body to take advantage of the cold, the dark, and the scarcity that's there. Perry, thank you so much for coming back on and having this conversation. There's so much more that we could have talked about that we didn't get to. So I'd love to have you share with the viewers where they can learn more about you and where they can find you to learn more about all this information. Sure. Thanks, Melissa. I know I love these chats. They seem to fly by. It's crazy. Okay. So my website's a great hub, carriebewellness.com. You can take a look at the courses that I teach to help you help your body heal with this information. You can engage. I've got a community, a private community where we talk about this stuff and we kind of geek out about this fun stuff. Instagram is still my home, Carrie B. Wellness on Instagram, because I want to share this stuff for free and make it bite-sized, like these bite-sized posts for you to digest this information. And so those are the best places to really start to interact with this and learn more. And heck, if ever, if ever you want to just even shoot me an email, you'll find my contact info on my website. And just even if you want a book list, right, or a research article or something like that, feel free to do so. Wonderful. I'll have those links in the description. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and comment with your thoughts and opinions and check the description box for the links to my free community where I share lots of resources, my pay what you can community where we do classes and challenges together, my TikTok, Instagram, my clips channel, and lovecoveredlife.com where I share my paintings. Thank you so much for your support.